Isn't it nice to see so many smiling faces? Look at them all smiling away. Well, I always remember that yeah. when we had meditation retreats, some people would always take the photograph on the last day of the retreat. <laughs> And when it was one of these strict retreats, everyone was always smiling on that day. Yeah, I think that's really you should always do the photographs in the middle of the retreat. Mm-hmm. That's more much more accurate. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, they'd say, look at the people, they're so happy after a retreat. Yeah, because they're out of here. <laughs> no. We should take a photo. Is it possible to take photos nah. of the screen? Without people's names, it is. No, it's just group photo. No. I'll ask the co-host; they can do it. Okay, got you your, can take screenshots. You've got a people's permission. Yeah, yeah, we will have the permission. Yeah, basically write in if you don't want to be there. Yeah, I'll write. but we take away your names. I'll write in straight away. You write in. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so we know what to write to. Yeah, I'll find that. Uh, I'll write to the camera. I'll write to Mister Matbook. Who? Scottish fellow. No, the Scottish guy who owns the, the laptop, Mr. Mac Book. Oh, okay. <laughs> anyway. Okay, sorry. You still I mean, want to... Oh, dear. Do you still want to do the sitting first, or do you want to do the... Yeah, I, actually, I prefer to do the sitting first. It's only for half an hour. Yeah. And then we can do the talk, and then afterwards we have the surprise. Okay. Is that okay? Shall we do that? Yeah, we'll do that. So everyone in the mood for sitting? Yeah. And the sitting will be a tiny bit of guidance, but it's often just to get you nice and peaceful and calm. Um, hello, Teddy's. Okay. Hey. I'm sitting too. You can keep the Teddy downstairs. Keep the Teddy. <laughs> okay. So... Uh, if you'd like to close your eyes, Teddy, please close your eyes. I don't think he knows how. And with the eyes closed, please get into a comfortable position. And when the, you're in a comfortable position, just relax the body. This is only half an hour's meditation. So you don't need to spend too long on getting the perfect posture. But it's only half an hour. And feel the peace in the body, the quietness in your room. So you can feel what it's like to let go and make peace with things. There's many things you will have to do later on, but leave that to later on. Now's the opportunity for being calm. And letting everything settle down. What you're doing, you're having a ceasefire with this moment. Not trying to change how you feel. Not trying to acquire something new. But learning how to be at peace and respecting your body in this moment, respecting all your senses in this moment, just allowing them to be, to coexist peacefully. The only way you can do that is with kindness. This beautiful kindfulness, the softness and the awareness which can learn from what is going on right now. Now, it was usually the custom that the last meditation I would do would always be a loving kindness meditation. I did the usual loving kindness meditation yesterday. But of course, there's always an alternative. So I invite you, if you wish, to join in this alternative loving kindness meditation. You're sitting here with your body and mind. 
And imagine a sphere around you, not much bigger than you. And inside the sphere is not only your body, but your memories and your future and your present. But even some of your body is outside that circle, outside that sphere. Some of your past is outside too. And some of your future outside. What's inside this wonderful little bubble is all the things which you are content with. All those experiences, hopes for the future, which are beautiful and cherishing. And all the people, your good friends, the people who love you and you love them, they're also inside this circle. On the edge of that circle is the people, the experiences, even as parts of the body, which are kind of okay, but sometimes give you a little bit of trouble. They're on the edge, and maybe outside. And just outside your sphere of acceptance, just outside is the people you don't like. They're not too bad. The situations which you don't like, they're kind of bearable. And the past, which was a bit boring, but it wasn't that bad. And the further you go away from the center of your sphere or circle, however you wish to imagine it, there lie the people, the experiences, those parts of your body, which do cause you problems, which do arouse negativity. And the further you go away from the center of the circle, there are the people and the memories, the fears and experiences, which get even harder to bear. The further you will go away from the center, the more painful those experiences and those people and those situations are. In the center of the circle, all the things which you love and care for and find happiness and contentment with, the further you go away from the center, the harder it is to bear those things. And that's like your life. Now you focus on the edge of that circle. There's people outside, just on the outside, experiences which weren't easy. People who have difficulties, but you still love them. Imagine the diameter of that circle expanded as your loving kindness, your tolerance, your forgiveness. Go to some of those people who may have annoyed you, who may have caused you difficulty, but it wasn't that bad. They did not have ill will towards you. So expand that circle just a little bit to embrace them. Embrace the only mild negativity. So your sphere, what you allow in to your life with a smile, the diameter of that sphere or circle gets larger. And you find when you allow in those situations, those beings, those experiences, which did annoy you, and now you can sort of, oh, it's only a small thing. You can allow them in. How do you feel? As you expand this circle, 
you find you are practicing loving kindness and forgiveness and embracing. And it feels much more peaceful, like you're not at war with the world anymore. There's still more outside the circle. So we want to expand it even more. And if you imagine the circle of love, the circle of meta, doesn't mean you agree with what those people did. It has been done. We can forgive and learn and grow and embrace. As you start to embrace that circle, so expand that circle and embrace more and more of the people and their acts and their speech and their behavior. You can embrace more. We all make mistakes and hopefully we learn from our mistakes to be better human beings afterwards. And then as one expands the circle, more and more situations, memories, fears of the future, pain in the body, sicknesses in the body, more of them can be embraced. You're allowing them in instead of keeping them outside. When they're in, they don't have to be fixed up anymore. They're just part of who you are. They're part of your life. We embrace it. Anything painful and difficult, it's our learning experiences. Anything unpleasant, it doesn't last. If you keep expanding that sphere, expanding the diameter more and more and more, it is actually quite pleasant to forgive and embrace, to let go of the faults of the past. When we get angry at other people's faults, we've done the same or worse. If you can't remember in this life, often in previous lives, that's why we have to learn. The best way of learning is to the direct experience. To know what it's like to be criticized unfairly. When you know how that feels, you'll never do it to another person. It hurts. So when you know how that feels, sometimes you can thank the person who abused you. Thanks for teaching me. This is how unacceptable this is. I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to vow never to do that myself ever again. That's something you can do. Which means you find this skillful means of expanding that circle wider and wider. And you start to include some of the difficult things of life. The sicknesses and the deaths, because I have done a lot of time working with people with cancer. It surprised me at first. I've never had cancer myself in this life. But I do remember so many of the people with cancer. I'd always say that was the best thing which ever happened to me. It was unpleasant and painful. I learned so much. I wouldn't have learned so much if I hadn't gone through those painful experiences. It changes people's lives for the better. So all those experiences, one brings into one circle by expanding its diameter. An experience with your parents, experiencing other abusive relationships. Why did not why did you not care for yourself enough? 
Why did you think you deserved it? Some people, unimaginably, they do. You don't deserve to be abused. Everyone deserves respect and kindness. So at least we can learn from these things. And that gives you a little trick to be able to bring them into the circle. And things like death, when somebody does die, I remember all the wonderful things which they did in their life and how privileged I was to have known them. So even death gets brought into the circle. You expand the circle of loving kindness, being open the door of your heart to more and more things. First of all, the easy things, and the moderately difficult, and the average difficult. Then you go further, the really difficult things. The person has been really terribly treated. They can use that experience of demeaning themselves, stigmatizing themselves, thinking they don't belong. Or they can use that incredible wisdom and even more incredible compassion. I've said many times, when you tread in the dog shit, you must always bring it home with you. It's valuable fertilizer. And it makes the apples on your tree whatever else you're growing, far more delicious. It's hard to bear, but the results are amazing. So expanding the circle, you can imagine around you, this sphere, this circle of acceptance, growing bigger and bigger, wider, more embracing. When you embrace the moderately difficult, it gives so much relief and freedom. One doesn't have to spend one's life being afraid it might happen again, or being angry at the people who did this for you to you. You treat in a totally different way. Much more free, much more peaceful. And then you expand it even further. Expand it and keep on expanding it. The more you expand that circle of what you accept and what you reject, the more free you feel. Until, of course, you can expand that circle of acceptance and love and peace and freedom all the way to the ends of the universe. You're making peace with everything. You may not like it, you may not approve of it. This is how everyone must learn. When that sphere that circle embraces everything, it means you are at peace with all. Not just the nice parts of life, not from the parts of life you approve of, with everything. The loving kindness becomes unbounded, apamana, without any measure, infinite, all embracing. It's like the sun, as I mentioned before, it shines on the good people and the psychopaths and narcissists. It shines on all of us. The sun does not discriminate. May the sun of your loving kindness 
never discriminate against anybody. The Dharma is often compared to being a tree which gives shade to all beings. Even a tree gives shade to the person who cuts it down. But now the tree grows. That type of loving kindness, accepting, forgiving, understanding its purpose, so we can learn and grow and be better. Now for the next five minutes, I'll be quiet. See how much you can bring in, which was outside before. See its meaning and its purpose.
So how do you feel now? What's it like inside your body and mind? Embracing loving kindness, all beings, all situations, all times. There's a freedom, a liberation. When you've got unfinished business with somebody, it's like you're in jail, you're in debt, haven't finished with the tasks of your life. Forgiveness doesn't mean you can learn what other people do. It means you can kind of understand stupidity, drug abuse, person, their own uh, delusions pressured into them. And who knows? You may be able to give that forgiveness and then you are free. So when you are ready, please open your eyes to complete this short 30 minute meditation. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to uh, have a short talk now as well. So if you need to go to the toilet or whatever, it's only been a half an hour meditation. Hopefully you are fine. And so the talk will be for about half an hour. And then we can have a break afterwards before we do the surprise event. So for the talk, there's, there's some times that, again, I give so many talks every day, sometimes two or three in different venues. And so I do repeat myself, and I apologize for that. But some of the stories I always give a little twist to to make sure that they are always relevant. And this story, which I often say at the end of a retreat, is one of the best. And it answers the question, now, what relevance does this meditation retreat have for when we go to work? Many people say, they what? how can we use this meditation, this Dharma, when we go into the real world? And straight away, I sort of balk at that statement. The real world? When was the last time you were in a shopping centre? That's not real. They actually put smells through the air conditioning to try and make people relax. They use psychologists to make sure that the colours will make you buy things. They position all of the items in a place where... You know, you can get those as you go out. Is that real? And when I see the people in the shopping centres, you see them all wearing makeup. Is that real? I don't wear makeup. <laughs> well, I must admit that twice in my life I've worn makeup. I admit it. And that was when you, know, you were interviewed on TV in those days where you had to have something on your face. Otherwise, your face would look really weird on TV. But I do remember that one of the first times I did that, I was going to giving this um, sermon uh, on uh, the cathedral. This was the time, it was the first time, according to the dean of the cathedral, we shouldn't know what he's talking about, but the first time that a non-Christian, let alone a Buddhist, gave the Sunday sermon at a cathedral. And that was me, and so the, I was interviewed by the TV about that, and they said, you have to go 
into the makeup, otherwise your face looks really weird. And so as I was going into the makeup, Ajahn Bamali was with me, as many of you know Ajahn Bamali, and he was making faces at me all the time. <laughs> it was really cool. <laughs> Life again was only a bit of fun. And I actually asked the people in the, the new studio, you know, I asked them afterwards, can anyone refuse this? And they said the only one who's ever refused the makeup before an interview was, I think it was one of the lead singers of Oasis, I think Liam Gallagher or something. I got that right. So I, if I'd have refused, I could have joined the ranks of Liam Gallagher and Ajahn Brahm. I thought that would be quite cute. But anyway, <laughs> I never did. So, but anyhow, out there in the real world, the smells, the tastes, to try and control you. People use deodorants because they don't like real smells. Some you dye your hair. I don't dye my hair. This is how. But anyway, the real world. I like the real world in Buddhist temples where we're not supposed to use any sort of deodorants or makeup or jewelry. But just as you see us, this is how we are. And there's something like reassuring there. But anyway, when you go back to your offices and your place of work and go on the um, the public transport or in your own cars, why? What's the purpose of you know, having these um, meditations? And the story I like to tell is the story of the old my old sailor and the professor. If there's any professors here listening to this, maybe you can go to the toilet now because in any story with professors, it's the professors who usually come out worst off. I don't know why. It's not that I don't like professors, but just sometimes they're too much in their head. So anyway, this professor was sailing from London to Australia long time ago and the first night at sea on one of these old passenger boats after after the dinner he went on deck to stretch his legs and as he was stretching his legs the he saw this old sailor on the deck he went up to this old man and said how long have you been no, sailing as a, on the oceans. He said, ever since I was a small boy, I've been sailing on these oceans for decades. Oh, marvellous, said the professor. You must know everything about all those animals and the fish who live in the oceans. It's one of my hobbies, marine science. Marine what? said the old sailor. Marine science. You know, all the different animals and just how they breed, how they relate to one another, what they eat. You must know so much of this. And the old sailor says, I know nothing about marine science. What, said the professor, all these years at sea, you never looked at a book on the animals which swim underneath your boats? No. And the professor was disgusted. When people have opportunities and they don't take them, sometimes people get very upset. So the professor said to the sailor, you stupid old man, what a waste of a life. And he walked off. The second night at sea, after dinner, it was such a beautiful dinner, that the professor was in a good mood. And when he walked on deck, he saw the old sailor up there again. And this time the old sailor was looking at the stars in the sky. It was a beautiful, clear, clear night. And the professor said, hmm. Old man, you've been many years, many decades sailing these boats. You must have seen this beautiful um, starlit sky so many times. He said, oh, yeah, many evenings. He said, you must know a lot about astronomy. That is one of my hobbies too, astronomy. What have you learned about astronomy of all these years? And the old sailor said, nothing. I know they're stars, that's about all. Nothing else. Well, you don't know the names of the constellations, which is a galaxy, which is a planet, which is just a, a meteor in the sky. I know nothing about that, said the old man. 
You stupid old man, you stupid old man, what a waste of a life, what a waste of a life, said the old professor, and he walked away. The third night at sea, don't worry, I know it's a bit of a shaggy dog story, but it's coming to the end soon. The third night at sea, <laughs> the professor had such an amazing meal, and it was a beautiful evening at sea, just a, a very gentle breeze was wafting over the oceans. And so the professor decided to give this old sailor one more chance. And he said to the sailor, yes, OK, I can accept you don't know about marine science or the animals beneath you. I can understand you don't know about astronomy and the stars above you, but you must know about the weather. The weather can drive your ship faster. It can sink your ship. You must be an expert on the weather systems, on meteorology. And the professor, uh, the sailor said, no, I know nothing about the meteorology at all. I know nothing about the winds and the storms. I know nothing. And the professor was really disgusted this time. You stupid old man. You stupid old man, you stupid old man, what a waste of a life, what a waste of a life, what a waste of a life. Because the professor himself was a doctor of meteorology. He was going to Australia to give lectures there about the winds and the storms. And this old man had wasted his life not learning anything about the, the winds around him. The fourth night at sea. The professor never had dinner because it was a rough night at sea. And the uh, professor suffered from seasickness. He realized if he put anything in his tummy, it would come out in the evening. It was a very rough night. And that storm got worse and worse and worse the later the night became. And when it was just past midnight, the storm was so bad that his cabin was rocking backwards and forwards, like as one of these rides in these, these theme parks. And it went so, was rocking so much, the professor could not sleep. And then, without any warning, he heard this massive... I hope I didn't disturb any of you. <laughs> you still all alive? There's a massive sound, and everything went quiet. And then the professor was quite scared. He didn't know what had happened. And then he heard something running outside his door. And in fear, he opened his cabin door. And who was running outside? The old sailor. And the old sailor paused. He turned to the professor of meteorology and he asked the professor, in all your years at universities, have you ever learned how to swim? The professor said, oh, actually, no, I can't swim. You stupid old professor, you stupid old professor, you stupid old professor. What a waste of a life. The ship is sinking. So anyway, the, me <laughs> the mat tail is, if you're going to go on a boat, if you're going to sail in a ship, it's great to learn about marine science or meteorology or astronomy. The most important thing to learn if you're going to sail on a ship is how to swim, how to keep your head above water, when things start to go wrong. And that's one of the reasons why in life, you may learn all sorts of different skills in life. But the most important skill to learn, again, is how to keep your head above water, as they say in the metaphor, when there's so many difficulties in your life. When you may lose your job, when your relationship splits apart, and when one of your loved ones passes away, when there's difficulties, can you keep your head above water? And that's actually what the meditation retreat teachers want to do. 
how to have these different abilities to keep peaceful and to keep still when everybody else is panicking and you can just sit there. It's the best thing to do and create peace in your life and for those who are around you. I know so many times that people look at, say, monks and nuns, why are you living like this? You could be doing so much more in the world, they think. But then when there are tragedies, when there are very difficult situations to deal with, that's sometimes when the training, when the practice, when all that one has learned, the wisdom one has accumulated over those years, starts to blossom forth. One of the monks we're going to meet soon and next week over in Oslo. I remember this monk because uh, when he did ordain in Perth, uh, his parents weren't all that keen on him ordaining. He ordained anyway. And then he found out that his father had a heart attack. And so he came up to me and asked if he could go home to see his parents because his father was in need. And of course, he said, yes, of course you can go. But then he showed me the, the email his elder brother had sent him. He said, our mother said, you're welcome to come to Oslo, but please don't wear your robes. We'll have a suit ready for you. And then he showed me this. He didn't want to put this robe. He loved being a monk. And so I told him to write back to his uh, family that my abbot, which was me, tells me it's either these robes or naked. You can make the choice. So he wore his robes. And he looked after his family. His father actually died. And so he was there much longer expected. But when he came back, he came back with a letter from his brother, his elder brother. And it's a wonderful letter his older brother wrote, saying, when my younger brother became a monk, we didn't understand what on earth he was doing and why he was doing it. But when my father died, his father died, that my younger brother was just the rock, the stability, the wise, kind person in our family who kept us all together and gave us so much peace and happiness in this difficult time. We want you to know, Ajahn Brahm, that our son is welcome to stay as a monk forever. We've seen the benefit. And that's the story one amongst many. Sometimes the monks and nuns Sometimes the service and the strength and the wisdom and the kindness, that's our life. That's what we do more than anything else. We may, may not be able to advise well on the economy. We may not know too much about medicine, I mean, for the body. But the medicine of the mind, wow, this is where we can be the experts. And that's one of the reasons why that this family found out from their son just what this meditation can do for each one of us. And if you haven't discovered that yourself yet, you will find the more time you go on retreats, the more times that you practice your virtuous behavior and understand why you practice it, and the kinder, the wiser, the more compassionate you become, you become an invaluable resource for yourselves and others. Even many years ago, when I was traveling in Thailand, I was on one of these flights and looked, they gave me a copy of the Bangkok Post, something to read on the flight. And there was an article in that newspaper about the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok. It's a very old hotel, 
And that year, it had been voted the best hotel in the world. And so that someone had done an interview with the managing director of the Oriental Hotel in Bangkok, asking why. Why has your hotel won this award this year? Is it because you pay your staff so much? No. Is it because, you know, that you have more staff to guest ratio? No. Why have you won this award? And the owner of the hotel, or the managing director, I forget which, said, it is because that even though many of our workers are not Buddhists, there's many Christians and Muslims as well in our workforce. Every year, we send every worker in this hotel, no matter whether they're cleaners or the, the concierge or the desk staff or whatever, we send everybody in this hotel to a monastery to do a one-week meditation retreat at the hotel's expense not taking it off their holidays. We do that because we know just how that increases their kindness, their sensitivity. So they can serve our clients with more sensitivity, with more peace, their smiles are greater. And they also found they take less sick leave because they don't get as sick when they have this meditation retreat once a year, paid for at the, the firm's expense. They said, that's why we do this. It's economically well-grounded as being good for our bottom line. That's why I always think that, you know, because you sit down on a cushion for such a long time, it does increase your bottom line. That's a big joke, sorry. <laughs> but thank you for laughing. <laughs> but anyhow, there is economic benefit, there's health benefits. That's why people just want you know you to you know, teach this type of meditation in hospitals even more. There's great health benefits. And also in schools as well. Recently, you know, in Australia. The big exam is in year 12, so people are 17. And I was surprised, but pleased, that I got an invitation to spend a day at Perth's local Jewish school, Carmel College, just for Jewish boys and girls. Why? I knew the chaplain there, Moshe Bernstein, he's a good friend, and he says that we're really concerned that our students are getting stressed out before the year 12 exams. Can you please come and spend a day with them? Teach them how to meditate, which I did. Teach them the same things which I've taught you. And the wonderful thing was uh, a couple of weeks later, I got a personal letter from the, the principal of Carmel School saying thank you, Ajahn Brahm, for spending the day with us, with our year 12s. I just wanted to let you know, I checked it out afterwards. That year, they were the top school in the state. So many people pass those exams. So the top school. And that kind of just was reinforcing what you already knew. But some of these meditations, some of these ways of looking at life, can actually be so positive that even in a Jewish school, not Buddhist, they get so many benefits, so many good results. That's one of the reasons why what you hear here, what you learn here, is very applicable to your daily life. And many, many things, learning how to be kind to the people you, you live with, and work with. There's one story which comes to mind of one of the Buddhists, and she was not a high executive, but middle executive in a big company. And one of her best friends in that company was promoted. And once the 
best friend had been promoted to position senior to her, it was like the best friend was almost obsessed with her authority and started ordering her around and not being the kind friend she was before, but sometimes being very nasty and controlling. And she asked me what should, should she do? And of course, the answer was always kindness. And this uh, person who missed out on a promotion, because she'd been a friend to this girl before, she knew exactly what she liked. And so one day she asked her boss, would you like a coffee? Yeah. And so she went out and bought an expensive, but very nice coffee, which she knew they'd enjoyed when they were equals in the company. And she gave it to her boss. And just that one unasked piece of kindness changed the relationship totally around. Or one of these other cases of people who have problems, you know, with their relations. There's a Vietnamese girl who married an Australian, and she just could not get a good relationship with her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law, you know, was quite, um, uh, you might call racist, you know, to the Vietnamese, and said, why don't you marry a nice Australian girl instead of a Vietnamese girl? And the Vietnamese girl was a lovely girl. She tried her very best to be kind to her mother-in-law, but nothing worked. So she tried to meditate and spread love in kindness, but nothing worked. And then one day she was in the Vietnamese temple and she was praying, doing some puja there. And because she was so concerned and hadn't really rested, this Vietnamese girl fell fast asleep. This is a true story. When she fell fast asleep, she saw the image in her dream of the Vietnamese goddess of mercy, you know, the Quan Yin. You may have seen the Quan Yin statues. And it was a typical Quan Yin statue, you know, just the woman with the long hair and the little um, bottle of uh, nectar to help people. Everything was just like an ordinary statue in the temple, except for the face. And the face was in the usual depiction of Kuan Yin. The face was her mother-in-law's face. <laughs> it looked exactly like her mother-in-law. That shocked her so much, she woke up. But that changed the whole relationship to her mother-in-law. She looked upon her mother-in-law like an embodiment of Kuan Yin. And because of that, the relationship with her mother-in-law changed. It was a positive perception, and that positive perception changed this girl's whole life. The mother-in-law mother -in -law loved her like a daughter, like they should do, and the husband was so happy. So little things like that, if you have a, a father-in-law, a mother-in-law who's giving you trouble, see if you can imagine their face. If they're a, a mother-in-law, you can imagine their face, like I agenda. <laughs> <laughs> if they're a father in law like me, fat with glasses. <laughs> and that might change the whole perception of the problem and it all heals it all up amazingly fast. I don't know if any psychologist ever says that, but anyway, it does work. And other little things, I remember doing at a psychology conference over in Sydney. And they asked me, you know, what? give me some Buddhist advice in my talk. And so I told them the story of just, you know, if you have got bad feelings towards yourself, you're negative towards yourself, then it's very easy to fix up. Many people know this in psychology. All you need to do is to bring it all up, first of all, write it on a piece of paper. But that's when I just gave the Ajahn Brahm twist to that method of acknowledging your faults. You can use it for other people's faults if you like. So first of all, sometimes there's so many, you need to get a big piece of paper. And the best piece of paper to use, which is quite inexpensive, is what we call a roll of toilet paper. And instead of writing it down in pencil or blue ink, Get a red, get a brown, a dark brown felt tip pen, 
and write down all of your own personal thoughts or the terrible things you've done on the roll of toilet paper in dark brown ink. And the association is quite clear. What else is dark brown which goes on toilet paper? <laughs> I think you all know that. So write it down in dark brown ink on toilet paper. If you can use the whole roll of toilet paper. And once you've written it down, then read it to yourself again. That reinforces it, that this is not something you should be keeping. You have to let it go. And where do you let go of uh, brown things on toilet paper? You go to the special shrine, the toilet cubicle. And there you look at all that stuff on toilet paper written in brown ink. And then you put it in the bowl and you do the letting go ceremony. I think you know what that letting go ceremony is. You press the button and it all goes out of your life forever. But please don't do that in Ayachanda's Vihara. <laughs> Otherwise, you block the toilets. <laughs> so that's actually how we do these things. So the benefits of meditation retreats are immense. And if you haven't discovered them yet, you will discover them soon. So that's one of the reasons why we spread this loving kindness, we learn some good wisdom, we put it into practice, and it actually works. Sadhu. Yes. Sadhu. I was going to finish. <laughs> okay, so sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We're not having a long break now, but we're having one in half an hour. Is that okay? Okay with me. Is that okay for everyone else? Yeah. Can you manage for half an hour? And then we'll have a, a full 15-minute break so you can get a cup of tea um, because we'll be continuing this morning till 11, so we don't want to make the next session too long. Um, so anyway, our lovely attendants here are just going downstairs and they're going to appear on the screen and uh, <laughs> tell a little story about Mr. Bear or Mrs. Bear. Or maybe this is... A gender non-binary bear. Yeah, the third, third gender. Yes. Bear. I fit in everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's an everywhere yeah. bear. And before we actually go to uh, this little lecture, a little documentary. Documentary. <laughs> these bears, they started off with in Hong Kong when somebody brought a couple of bears to the meditation retreat I was teaching. And those bears became so popular that we started started employing them uh, in meditation retreats. And you know, Hong Kong at that time was economically very strong. And so many of the people there were offering huge amounts of money for these bears. <laughs> I mean, like, like thousands of dollars. And the boy who actually owned the bear said, no, they're not for sale, because they gave him so much joy and peace and happiness. And that's one of the things why when you're meditating, we can be too tough on ourselves. Putting a bear on your lap or hugging a bear, uh, that gives a huge positive uh, boost of energy to your meditation. Mm -hmm. It encourages kindness. You know, all the bears are out now. <laughs> we can see all the bears. Yeah, the bears, yeah. So that's one of the reasons why. That even when I wrote a book called Bear Awareness, there's a big picture of a bear on the front. And it's a beautiful thing which helps one's meditation. It softens the mind. When the mind becomes soft, it's easier to make peaceful. Okay. So. All right. Let me just send a, say to Matthias that we can stop the live stream now. So bye-bye to everyone on live stream. We'll be uh, recording, I think, so you can always catch us later. Lovely to have you. <laughs> so.